lot of conversations about what we were going to call ourselves. And restoration was a very intentional choice. And so I explained to my church at the very beginning um, that when we understand the gospel, the gospel has four parts. And there's creation, there's the breaking of creation and fall, there's redemption where God God shows us that He remembers us, and that He's coming for us, that He's not forgotten us. And there's restoration. There's the renewal of all things. There's where He wants to take this world that He so loves. And so as we think about being the church, um, we do want to invite people to a relationship with Jesus. And we do that deliberately, repeatedly, winsomely. And as they come into a relationship with Jesus, we want them to come in to this project that Jesus has invited all, all of us to be a part of where He's going to bring a new heavens and a new earth. He's going to wipe away every tear. He is going to make right what has been wrong. And He's going to bring justice as He shows mercy and pours out His grace on this world that He loves. That's restoration. And it has deeply shaped the way we're a church together and the way we look at our county, Arlington County, and the way we think about the relationships we have in the world. About eight or nine years ago, I had read Tim Keller's book called Generous Justice, and, and I remember reading it and thinking, like, the way Tim is describing this is so beautiful and such, um, so much something that I want my church to be a part of. So I put together <clears throat> a post-Easter series, so for the season of Eastertide, that would follow the, the roadmap of that book and talk about God's heart for justice. And we talked about uh, what Nicholas Wolterstorff calls the, the quartet of the vulnerable. So we talked about you know the sojourner, the widow, the orphan, the poor. Um, and there, so much of Scripture talks about those things. So there's it's mostly like trying to figure out which thing do I talk about and leaving everything else out. Um, but as I brought our church through that sermon series, sorry, as I brought our church through that sermon series, I knew that there would be people who didn't like it, um, and. I remember a conversation with someone after when I started the series and the, the person said, are you planning to talk about justice for a while? <laughs> and I, I said, I hope so. I hope it's so much a part of our church. And, and, and he said, I, I think I'm going to have to go somewhere else. And I, I said, I understand. Um, and I think that that happened to Jesus as he would talk about um, what he wanted the kingdom to be. He watched people say, I, I can't be a part of that. And, and, and I've watched people sometimes through the ways that I say it or just the topics that I choose say, that is not something that I want to be a part of. So I knew that that would be a cost. But then we came to the week where I was talking about the stranger or the sojourner. I'm not sure I'll be able to get this, this one. <laughs> um, at the end of that sermon, um, we had these things <laughs> that we ironically called green cards. They were um, green welcome cards in our pews. And each week, if someone was new to the church, we'd say, hey, grab your welcome card and let us know you're here. And on this particular week, I said, I would love for you to respond to the sermon. I, I, I feel like God is calling us to consider helping out the immigrants who are in our county. and." If you have a desire to be a part of like serving immigrants or serving the stranger among us, could you just stick your name on the card and we'll see. We'll see what God is doing. So on that particular day, uh, we ask for volunteers all the time and we'll get you know a handful. We got like 75 cards back. And even to this day, like we've never had a response like that. And in our church, um, Arlington County is very close to Washington, D.C. So a lot of our 
parishioners are employed by the federal government. A lot of them um, work in the law. And so people were coming to me and saying, I've been waiting for the opportunity. Uh, I've been waiting for the opportunity to use some of my gifts and the ways God has created me in a way where I can you know, be a part of justice and mercy for people who are really struggling. Um, and two people in particular said, we would be happy to head this up. And so Restoration Immigration Legal Aid was born. And creating a 501c3 is not anything I was familiar with. Uh, but what I loved was um, that there is a legal process for people who have come to our country to find a way to be here and to stay here. And our church was willing to say, what, what people need is someone to come alongside them, to give them hope, to help them in the courts and to meet some of their holistic needs along the way, but to be with them as they work through a process that is often uh, dehumanizing and alienating. And we want people to know that we're so glad that they're here. So we call Restoration Immigration Legal Aid RILA for short. And they soon had a, a great group of volunteers that officed in our building. And about once a month, which soon became more often than that, they would have a clinic where people would volunteer from our church to be hospitable, to provide a meal, play with their kids. And then folks who were trained to help people go through the immigration process would would be translated and we would hear stories. What I loved about RILA and what I love about RILA, they still share our space, is that regularly people are coming into our church who would never come into our church. And I love that they come and they experience warmth and hospitality, welcome, that people are telling them, like, you're not alone, and we're glad you're here. Some of them occasionally come on a Sunday, but most of them don't. And I, I'm really okay about that, too, because I, I love the way the people who are there on Sunday look for ways during their week to be involved in the lives of people that if we hadn't created Ryla, they wouldn't have relationship with. But because we have, their lives are really transformed um, because they get to be with these people in a time where they're really challenged and we get to serve them. I believe that every church has people who want to connect their church to the needs of the world. People who want to see their church living out God's acts of justice and mercy. And they'll do the research to find out who are the organizations that are doing good things that we can partner with. They'll listen to neighborhoods and community groups who will talk about the needs that they have. And, and my hope is that Anglican churches would be intentional about listening to their neighborhoods and the communities around them and looking for opportunities to serve. It's made all the difference in our church, and I hope that people will look for opportunities to have that expression of justice and mercy, bringing Jesus' heart for the neighborhood and in their church as well.